Greetings from Saybrook University in Pasadena, California. I want to welcome our new students in the College of Integrated Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm happy to provide you with my introductory remarks for your Mind-Body-Spirit Integration Seminar by recording. My topic will be the emergence of integrative medicine, some of the history and some of the emerging paradigms. I will be talking about the face of illness changing, the need for a transformation in healthcare, visions of this new healthcare, paradigms and models for integrative medicine, and then summing up, bringing it all together, values for integrative healthcare. Our take home message today, the College of Integrative Medicine and Health Sciences is extending Saybrook's humanistic vision into healthcare, fostering an approach to health that is holistic, integrative, person-centered, relationship-centered, evidence-based, and oriented to mind, body, and spirit. The Mind, Body, Spirit Integration Seminar will introduce you experientially to a number of mind, body, spirit practices. You will be um, engaging in these practices in simple forms in this seminar. Those looking for more complexity, you surely will get it in your academic courses. Our academic courses are research-based, require extensive scholarly work, and you will be looking at the evidence base for integrative healthcare. But for this seminar, we're interested in you engaging in mind-body practices, uh, sharing those experiences in a small group, um, immersion experience. We invite you to remain open to whatever experiences these practices open up for, for you and allow yourself to experience the seminar at an emotional level, personal level, physical, intuitive, and spiritual level. The face of illness has changed. It's not just that we have a changing faddish or fashion change in healthcare and, and therefore we're going to do things differently. Illness itself has changed. 100 years ago, physicians typically faced acute conditions which often killed people very quickly. Infectious diseases, parasites, unhealed physical trauma, and average life expectancy was about 39 years. With the impact of public health, immunization, and antibiotic medications, um, many infectious illnesses have been eradicated or at least uh, contained to a large degree. Today's Western primary care clinic rarely sees typhoid, cholera, smallpox, or polio. So we have immunizations, we have clean water available um, in many uh, parts of the world. I personally have been involved in uh, bringing clean water access into areas, remote areas of Honduras, Haiti, um, and even parts of Africa through, through projects. So today, physicians are more likely to see people suffering with lifestyle-based illnesses, stress-related conditions, diseases of adaptation, adapting to our stressful way of life and to the environment, chronic illnesses and conditions, and conditions which are complex, which have biological elements, but also psychosocial elements. This is a worldwide shift. In the past, developing nations were typically challenged by communicable or infectious diseases. Developing countries now are suffering increased higher levels of health problems related to chronic disease. Factors involved contributing to the development of chronic illnesses worldwide are aging populations, rapid urbanization, and globalization of unhealthy Western lifestyles. With the emergence of COVID-19, we are once again seeing an infectious condition threatening the population worldwide. And the entire world is now seeing 
how an infectious disease interacts or intersects with chronic conditions. Those persons who have chronic illnesses such as kidney disease, diabetes, or heart disease are at greater risk um, for more serious complications with COVID-19, including death. So there is a global health challenge. Uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable populations in low and mid middle income countries are more likely to be exposed to harmful substances such as tobacco and excessive alcohol, poorer qualities of food, greater stress, and limited access to healthcare. The global burden of chronic and lifestyle-based illness impacts most heavily on disadvantaged groups in all countries. So we, we see a need for transforming healthcare, including healthcare in the United States. In the US, healthcare costs are escalating at a rate that we can't sustain. We already, uh, by uh, numbers available in the 2000s, spend more than 16% of our gross national product on health care and that the projections are for this to increase to nearly a third of our GNP by 2035. And yet many people in the U.S. still have no access to regular primary health care. Our statistics, our health statistics are also falling behind those of other countries in areas such as infant mortality. So as um, one leader in healthcare said, despite spending nearly twice as much, our results compared to other nations are disappointing. This is a graph showing um, that the US spends much higher amounts per capita than any other country, including all of the developed countries. In spite of higher spending, life expectancy in the U.S. was the lowest of all of the high-income countries at 78.8 years. In other countries, life expectancy is above 80, 80.7 to 83.9 years. Infant mortality rates were highest in the U.S. of any developed country, with 5.8 fatalities out of every 1,000 live births for other affluent countries, the average infant mortality rate was only 3.6 for 1,000 births. A report in 2016 actually showed the first reduction in life expectancy in the U.S. And reports in 2017 and 18 showed further decreases in life expectancy, now down to 78.6 years. So, what are some of the ideas um, that have been put forth about this new health care that we need? First of all, Harold Koenig, an expert in the relationship between religion, spirituality, and health, wrote, patients want to be seen and treated as a whole person, not as diseases. A whole person is someone whose being has physical, emotional, and spiritual dimensions. Neglecting any one of these aspects of our humanity leaves the person incomplete and may even interfere with healing. So integrative medicine is person-centered. It focuses on the human being's well-being, resilience, and coping for their entire lifespan. Biomedicine, mainstream medicine, too often focuses on the current illness and lab work. Person-centered Integrative healthcare seeks to strengthen the patient for a lifetime of better health. This is the continuum of health and disease developed by John Travis, which depicts the continuum that runs all the way from disease toward high wellness. Um, the average person coming into a clinic for mental health care or health care will be somewhere in the middle of this continuum with some negative health behaviors, some positive health behaviors. Those persons who have chronic illness are living with challenged health all of the time. The challenge now for integrative health care is to help people eliminate negative health behaviors, introduce larger numbers of positive health behaviors, leading people from disease or from challenged health to a state of moderate wellness or ideally high levels of wellness. 
Now, I do want to point out that Travis's continuum is somewhat uh, simplistic because, of course, a person may, in one aspect of their total being, uh, be challenged or even have a terminal illness, and yet in other aspects of their being, emotional life, spiritual life, they might be quite well. And our interventions can help people who have a chronic illness or who even have a terminal illness um, to live longer and to experience satisfaction, joy, and fulfillment in their life, all of which are markers of the higher end of this continuum. Now, for many years um, if in the fields of holistic health, uh, integrative health, we spoke of complementary and alternative medicine, CAM, complementary and alternative medicine. Complementary suggests a therapy that combines well with conventional care. Alternative implies using a therapy in place of conventional care. Well, as many one-time alternative therapies have been moved into the mainstream and even integrated into clinic and hospital care, um, we now speak more frequently of complementary and integrative medicine, recognizing that the optimal uh, state of healthcare comes when we combine complementary approaches into mainstream conventional care. So the person may uh, draw on mainstream biomedicine um, when they're stricken with cancer or heart disease, but they may also, in the same office, uh, benefit from nutritional interventions, uh, training in relaxation, imagery, hypnosis, biofeedback. Uh, they may benefit from acupuncture to assist them with pain or nausea um, in the same uh, care plan, which also includes medication. So complementary and integrative medicine uh, in embraces the best of biomedicine and the best of the complementary and alternative approaches. Andrew Weil is one of the leaders in integrative medicine, and he wrote that integrative medicine is healing-oriented medicine that takes account of the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, including all aspects of lifestyle. Integrative medicine emphasizes the therapeutic relationship and makes use of all appropriate therapies, both conventional and alternative. Um, there was a time when most physicians rejected any therapy that didn't seem to um, come out of a biochemically oriented uh, paradigm or framework. Uh, today, uh, many physicians accept acupuncture, even though it rests on a, a different understanding of the human being including uh, the idea of human energy fields or the chakras. Psychoneuroimmunology is a particular branch of holistic approaches to health. Psychoneuroimmunology pursues a scientific research-based understanding of how our mind and behavior impact on the nervous system, on our hormonal systems, and on immune processes. Um, we can make interventions such as hypnosis or the use of imagery which impact on our immune system so that our immune function becomes more optimal and we better um, our body better protects itself against illness uh, prominent names in this field include joan borisenko candace pert and janice kikolt glazer nicholas cummings expressed a vision of integrated health care bringing all care together under one roof. He wrote that the patient of the future will encounter an integrated system of behavioral and medical care involving a partnership of behavioral practitioners, physicians, and nurses in one house and one system. Now, this is happening um, in many places. San Francisco has the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, many cities have integrative care clinics which bring together multiple disciplines under one roof with an integration of care among the providers. Unfortunately, there are also many communities where integrative care looks more like this picture. Things are cobbled together, cooperation among the disciplines is often lacking, and in fact, many patients learn not to mention their complementary care 
to their primary care physician because the primary care physician is critical or even rejecting of these uh, other forms of treatment. Paradigms. Now, paradigms are conceptual models um, that uh, frame a field. Uh, so, for example, the, the paradigm for much of mainstream medicine is, is a biochemical paradigm, understanding um, the human being primarily as um, from the standpoint of anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. The paradigms evolving in integrative care um, are uh, often include elements of the biochemical paradigm, but also introduce new elements. Now, some of the paradigms simply involve how are we going to integrate and coordinate? And the first and most common one is a traditional medical hierarchy. Under this paradigm, the physician still is the primary provider and will typically prescribe a biomedical regimen of medication, which is supplemented with complementary and behavioral interventions. So the physician decides when to call in the allied health professionals or the complementary therapies. This paradigm continues the assumption that the primary intervention for a patient complaint is biomedical and that the medical physician is the best arbiter of the choice of treatment. The disadvantage of this paradigm is that for many chronic conditions and functional disorders, a complementary or behavioral intervention delivered very early in the onset of the disorder may reverse the disorder or at, at least help the patient manage the disorder and keep it from becoming um, severe or chronic. Further, no one, including the physician, can reliably predict which complementary intervention might dramatically relieve the disorder. Yes, we have research showing that certain therapies, including complementary therapies, can be efficacious or clinically effective in treating a specific disorder. Uh, nevertheless, we're frequently surprised when a patient responds to one element in the treatment plan, which we had not thought was the most important part of the treatment plan. Um, one observer has even said this hierarchical construct in medicine is the single most important ethical challenge facing medical education today. Now that was in an article which was critical of the effects that the hierarchical construct has on medical care. The next paradigm is very different from that medical hierarchy. Interprofessionalism is a communications-based paradigm. Integrated care, according to this paradigm, can be optimized with interprofessional teams working in a single setting. Co-location, being present in the same setting, enhances communication and increases patient follow-through on referrals to other disciplines. Diverse professionals work on a collaborative basis in a single setting, pediatric family practice or specialty medicine setting. The primary care home and specialty care uh, clinics integrate the interventions of physicians, nurses, psychologists, health coaches, and other health professionals. This interprofessional model is a challenge because it challenges us to better communicate with other healthcare providers from different disciplines. And further, at a time when corporate medicine is pushing for a reduction in minutes spent per patient encounter so that more patient encounters can be billed in a day by a single professional, interprofessionalism demands that we spend time communicating among the professionals and more time spent communicating with the patient, involving the patient further in developing the care plan. Another problem is that the evidence base for many complementary and allied health interventions is weaker and not sufficiently persuasive for medical personnel. Now, fortunately, research in the complementary therapies is getting stronger over time, uh, so this problem is being addressed. The public and community health paradigm. Well, at this point in the year 2020, worldwide, we are being challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic is making it clear that we must never 
take for granted public and community health. Um, the 19th and 20th century achievements of public health were notable and contributed to much of the health, health and healthcare that we take for granted today. Um, public health led to the availability of clean water, sanitation, immunizations. Community health clinics have provided care for people um, not affluent enough to pay for private care. But recent decades have seen a loss of funding and a loss of emphasis and credibility for public health. Access to health care, prenatal care, and adequate nutrition is lower in many U.S. neighborhoods than it is in countries like Cuba. Now, the other countries, such as Cuba, don't have the higher-end health care, um, the sophisticated health care addressing um, heart disease and, and sometimes cancer, uh, which are available in the U.S., but the basic care and the basic conditions for young mothers and for new babies especially um, are lower in American neighborhoods than in many other countries. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we learned um, that a big problem has been the lack of coordination among the hospitals and clinics in an American city or in a region. Hospitals and states in the U.S. competed with one another to buy personal protection equipment, ventilators, and other resources. New York State, on the other hand, worked very hard from a public health perspective to coordinate the resources regionally so that if there were beds available in one area of the city, those were utilized rather than uh, looking only at the, the present hospital where the patient first presented. The same thing was true with sharing resources. Lack of access to any health care at all compounded the problem with COVID-19 in low-income neighborhoods, contributing to the virus spread, especially in Hispanic and Black populations, uh, where the neighborhood conditions were, uh, came together with the emphasis on, for many of these uh, communities of working in um, essential jobs where there was high exposure uh, for risk and virus spread along with lack of access uh, to health care. Many countries with nationalized health care um, not only provide basic care, uh, prenatal care, um, early childhood care, but, <coughs> but also provide uh, support for complementary and integrative care through public resources. When I visited um, Austria in 2018 um, in a global engagement project with Saybrook University and IMC Krems University in Austria, um, I visited a uh, very large facility providing uh, cardiac rehabilitation, preventative health, um, and a lot of integrative care services ranging from uh, yoga to acupuncture to massage, all paid for um, for those persons uh, resident in the hospital, um, paid for by uh, national health insurance, uh, something that we really do not have in the U.S. We don't have that kind of uh, public support for integrative care. The next para paradigm I'm going to talk about, I call the smorgasbord paradigm. Now, you're all probably familiar with a smorgasbord where there are a variety of different foods and you just pick and choose whatever appeals to you. Um, in effect, many integrative medicine programs operate like a smorgasbord. Patients are offered a variety of mainstream and complementary treatments, and patients select those that suit their preferences. Um, I visited Miraval, or you might visit Canyon Ranch high-end health spas, and there are a variety of alternative modalities available on site, uh, ranging from mud baths to acupuncture to yoga uh, to nutritional counseling. And you pick and choose what you want. Now, because much of the delivery system for complementary therapies is market-driven, not covered by health insurance, but based on self-pay, Patient preference is often the primary factor driving treatment selection. 
moves to integrate complementary therapies into hospitals and medical clinics may moderate this effect and you may get more professional involvement in designing the treatment plan. Now, this is important because patient preferences um, do not always reflect the quality of the therapy. So for example, um, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, now renamed as the National Center for Com uh, Complementary and Integrated Healthcare, uh, data from these organizations suggest that the, the complementary therapies that patients are most likely to choose are not necessarily those for which research shows a strong effect. So getting professionals involved at least to educate the patient so that the choices the patient makes are well informed could be helpful. Epigenetics. Um, epigenetics studies how multiple variables influence what's called the translational process. How do we get from our DNA, which is fixed, to our actual health? And it turns out that there are many variables in our lives, in our surroundings, in our nutrition, in the stress of our life, in our emotional life, which influence the translation from the DNA into the actual health and illness experienced by the person. Everything that happens during the organism's life cycle can modify gene expression, either to the benefit of the person or to the detriment of their health. Now, for example, if you have identical twins, both of which have a DNA disposing them toward diabetes, um, one of them may have better um, activity levels, better nutritional choices, which will make a difference uh, such that that twin does not develop diabetes, whereas the other twin um, has the DNA, the disposition to diabetes, as well as um, poor nutritional choices, sedentary lifestyle, and therefore ends up actualizing that potential for diabetes. Now, what's interesting is that animal research indicates that epigenetic effects can carry over uh, for up to five generations from the original organism. So if we surround a person with very negative uh, sur uh, surroundings, negative nutrition, negative activity level, high levels of stress, lack of um, early bond, positive bonding. Um, and that person realizes much of the negative in their DNA in their health. So they have many illnesses, including chronic conditions. The next generations born from this person are also likely to, have to be at greater risk for actual, actual illnesses. Uh, so the epigenetic effects of this life cycle carry over into the next generation. Now, an example of that, um, stress, nutrition, drugs, and negative emotions will all adversely affect gene expression and health. And one example was the Dutch famine in 1944. This was during World War II. Uh, Nazi German army uh, was occupying the Netherlands. And most of the crops uh, grown in 1944 and 1945 were actually taken away immediately from Dutch farms and exported to Germany for the German population and also for the German army. So there were months of malnutrition producing uh, increased vulnerability to diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and even schizophrenia, severe mental illness, in children born to women pregnant during the famine. So regardless of the conditions in their own life cycle, they carried over the negative effects um, from their mother's experience during the war. Bruce McEwen is a leader in stress research. Um, and Bruce published this article, Integrative Medicine, Breaking Down Silos of Knowledge and Practicing an Epigenetic Approach. He argues in this article, that epigenetics is a good model for us to look at in integrating healthcare. Uh, these were some of the things he emphasized. First of all, we need to pay attention to early life experiences because they shape the health and disease which the person will experience later on. 
we really have to intervene early when we identify that a child has suffered abuse, neglect, or ill effects of poverty. Because if we intervene early, we can buffer or reduce the lifelong health consequences. Um, this paradigm says that we need to intervene long before the patient develops symptoms. McEwen also says we need to pay attention to the lived experience of the patient. Personal experiences enhance or inhibit the response to healthcare and how I personally interpret the events of my life, how I subjectively experience them is just as important as what actually happens. Further, um, stress, what is called allostatic load, the cumulative buildup of, of the effects of stress and stress overload all interact with biomedical conditions so that if you're vulnerable to diabetes and you're under high stress, you're more likely to develop uh, clinical diabetes. Uh, McEwen also emphasized what we call neuroplasticity, that with positive conditions, we can, the brain can regenerate neurons and dendrites, but the brain can also shrink dendrites under negative conditions such as stress. Um, McEwen emphasized physical exercise, social integration, finding meaning in life, um, and emphasized that behavioral interventions, psychotherapeutic interventions, even mindfulness training can moderate chronic illness, enhance the brain's regrowing of cells, neurons, and dendrites, and improve our regulation of mood and emotion. So we've talked about several paradigms, the traditional medical hierarchy, interprofessionalism, communication across disciplines, the smorgasbord approach. We've talked about epigenetics. Now I'm going to shift and look at lifestyle medicine and along with lifestyle medicine, health coaching. So what do we mean by lifestyle medicine? Well, lifestyle medicine is a branch of evidence-based medicine. So this is something that's founded on research. And we use comprehensive lifestyle changes, including nutrition, physical activity, stress management, social support, and certain kinds of environmental exposure to prevent, to treat, and to reverse the progression of chronic illnesses. So we're addressing the lifestyle variables that are the underlying cause of chronic illness. Sagner, Egger, and others published an article and they pointed out that nine lifestyle related factors and lifestyle induced medical conditions account for 90% of cardiovascular disease. Now the nine factors they point to are smoking, excess alcohol consumption, physical inactivity, low to poor diet, um, high stress, hypertension, and high cholesterol. The evidence is clear, better health lies in the direction of correcting these factors Yet physicians have been telling patients to change these factors. Stop smoking, lose weight. I'd like you to eat healthier. You've got to do something about your stress for decades with relatively little effect. So clearly the challenge is how do we help people to make changes in lifestyle that then will affect their health. Dean Ornish, medical doctor, is a pioneer in lifestyle medicine. He developed a, a residential program. Patients had to live in his setting and they were given a program of whole foods, plant-based vegetarian diet, smoke stopping, physical exercise, stress management, yoga and meditation. So quite a combination of healthy um, lifestyle elements. Outcome studies were strong enough that Medicare actually compensates patients for participating in the Ornish residential program. Now what's interesting is that this program um, initially was based residentially. Now it's available on an outpatient basis uh, through the Ornish organization and their, the Ornish uh, research is continuing to show significant lifestyle change. So you don't actually have to live in that setting although it may be helpful, particularly if your lifestyle is more 
negative. Now, what are some of the documented effects? Well, patients with cardiovascular illness actually reduce their triglycerides, reduce their cholesterol, lower their blood pressure, and increase myocardial perfusion. If you look at the diagram up at the top of this slide, the artery on the left has good blood flow. It's wide open. The artery on the right is narrowed by plaque, atherosclerotic plaque, and you can tell there's very little room for circulation. Many patients in Ornish's lifestyle-based studies showed a measurable opening up of the coronary artery blockages, reversing plaque formation. So we actually can reverse the long-term effects of negative diet, inactivity, um, if we adopt positive lifestyle choices. Another positive development, um, heart patients who also had depressive illness showed significant improves, improvements in their depressive mood um, when they finished the Ornish program. So they were less depressed, mood was more positive. This is a quotation from David Katz and it really summarizes um, we know these things, now we have to implement them. We let this happen every day, he wrote. We ate it and we abetted every day. All the while, we developed new drugs, new devices, new stints, new statin medications, and we learned CPR to contend with diabetes that doesn't need to happen fully 90% of the time or more, heart disease that doesn't need to happen fully 80% of the time or more, we seem to accept that it's a midlife rite of passage. Will I have an angioplasty or a coronary artery bypass graft? Take a number, have a nice procedure. You can wait in the fast food restaurant. Next. So that's the message. And now I mentioned that I'm considering lifestyle medicine here and health coaching together. And the reason for that is that health coaching is the practice of applying evidence-based techniques to modify lifestyle. So we know that lifestyle change can be positive for illness, including chronic illness. Health coaching can help people to make those lifestyle changes to reduce the risk, health risk behaviors and increase health enhancing behaviors. Health coaching takes the human capacity to make changes and optimizes it. So what does the health coach do? The coach invites the patient into a collaborative alliance for health. So a relationship which is mutual, which involves educating the patient, inviting the patient into a dialogue about their health. Um, the coach uses motivational interviewing techniques to draw on and draw out the patient's own motivation and goals. Um, one of the influences in the coaching field is called self-determination theory. And self-determination theory has concluded that the more autonomous a behavior is, the more personal commitment is mobilized. When I feel that, number one, I'm capable of carrying out a task, I'm choosing to do it, it's been my choice to focus on this change, um, and I'm supported uh, by a coach or uh, community which cares about the positive effects I'm going to produce, I'm much more likely to follow through on making lifestyle change. And shifting now to a, another paradigm, but again, it's not that diff it's not completely different. There are overlaps with lifestyle medicine, overlaps with health coaching. Functional medicine, um, is a paradigm bringing together the healing powers of nutrition with laboratory assessment. Now, simplistically, people think about nutrition and health as, well, we'll just identify the 10 healthy foods. And certainly there are healthy foods, which are likely to be benefit anybody who eats more of them. And there are unhealthy foods, which are destructive to most of us. But functional medicine recognizes that not everyone is the same. Not everyone has the same nutritional uh, deficits. Um, and the optimal intervention isn't going to be the same for everyone. 
So functional medicine uses laboratory, laboratory testing, um, blood, blood testing, urine testing, stool testing, um, even in some cases, hair mineral analysis to identify mineral deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies to develop an understanding of food sensitivities or food allergies, and then to develop a regimen of food choices uh, which is optimal for this person. Now, earlier I was talking about DNA and the translation process. In other words, we may have a certain DNA, but whether we actualize all of the positive or negative potentials in that DNA depends on many factors in our life. And functional medicine draws on what's called nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. These are two aspects of epigenetics. Um, Nutrigenomics investigates how do nutrients modify the regulation of gene expression. So diet regulated genes play a role in the onset and, and progression of certain diseases. And when we can identify through nutrigenomic analysis, um, which uh, nutrients are needed, uh, we have the potential for preventing, mitigating, or treating chronic diseases and even certain cancers through strategic dietary changes. Nutrigenetics, on the other hand, studies how genetic variation influences the interaction between nut nutrition and disease. Research on nutrigenetics offers hope of a more individualized medicine, which is called precision medicine, based on an understanding of this individual's nutritional needs, their health status, their genotype. Um, one example uh, came from a German sports uh, school in Cologne. And this study found that health counseling informed by a nutrigenetic analysis was more effective than conventional dietary counseling for weight management. In another very large study, those participants who had a specific genetic variation, variant or a variation in their DNA showed greater weight loss from intensive lifestyle interventions than people without that genetic variant. So clearly, if we can make these kinds of identifications, we're going to spend our money uh, providing this intensive lifestyle intervention to the right people, those who are more likely to benefit from it. Now, the pathways here are reciprocal. Genetic markers predict the patient's response to interventions, but interventions also can buffer or blunt the effects of the genetic markers. And I'll give you some examples here from research. <coughs> Excuse me. In the pounds lost study, those persons who had an A obesity risk allele, a particular genetic marker, showed greater weight loss on a high protein diet. In another study, research participants who had a, another genetic marker at a particular location in the DNA showed more frequent progression to diabetes. However, those participants who had this marker but then also received a lifestyle intervention showed less frequency of developing the diabetes. So the genetics predicts but the nutrition can actually modify or moderate the genetic influences. So again, just summarizing, lifestyle medicine, positive lifestyle elements can help us restore health. Identifying negative lifestyle elements uh, can help us to recognize factors that are reinforcing illness. Health coaching is a series of strategies and approaches which are effective in helping human beings make changes in their lifestyle. Functional medicine uses lab testing and even genetic ana analysis um, to develop nutritional regimens uh, which have a positive effect on health. Now, competencies-based paradigms for integrative medicine. Education in the health sciences is moving toward a competency-based approach. This parallels evidence-based approaches to practice, 
So we, we are doing research, identifying therapies which are most effective for a specific disorder. We're also going to educate health professionals using a competency-based approach. What are the skills or competencies which every um, integrative and functional nutritionist should have by the time they graduate? Or what are the competencies that a mind-body therapist should have uh, by the time they graduate? So research on core competencies for integrated and integrative healthcare has focused on optimal integration of medical and behavioral health services. Um, one commentator said, competence as a licensed behavioral health provider working in primary care refers to the knowledge, skills, and attitudes and their interconnectedness that allow an individual to perform the tasks and roles in that setting. So one consensus conference was held in Colorado and eight competencies were, were developed. Uh, the first one is identify and assess behavioral health needs as part of a primary care team. Engage with patients in their care and activate the patients. Work as a primary care team member, which means creating and implementing care plans that address behavioral health elements. Um, help observe and improve care team function and relationships. So improving the relationships in the care team improves the quality of care. Communicate effectively with other providers, with staff and with patients. Provide efficient and effective care delivery, meeting the needs of the population in the primary care setting. Provide culturally responsive whole person and family oriented care. We have to adapt care approaches when we have people from a different ethnic group, from a different national group, from a different uh, racial disposition, we have to know the culture of the community or we're going to be ineffective. And finally, understand value and adapt to the diverse professional cultures of an integrated care team. I certainly learned this working in medical settings where I had to understand the culture of nursing and the culture of medicine if I was going to be an effective psychophysiologist in those settings. Uh, a similar conference uh, took place in Annapolis, the Annapolis Coalition on the Behavioral Health Workforce. I'm not gonna go through all of these competencies, but just looking at the screen, you can see they emphasize not just learning biochemistry, learning diagnostics, learning disorders, rather they emphasize things like communication, collaboration, coordinating care, cultural competence. So these are the kinds of competencies that are necessary in integrative care. Finally, I'm going to look at health ecosystems paradigms. Our environments can be pathogenic. Our environments can be conducive to health. Um, and there are many ways in which scientists today and uh, healthcare professionals are looking at the environment of the patient um, and examining its contribution to illness or to health. Um, I'm going to use the example here of what's emerging as forest medicine. Now forest medicine emerged in Japan, but it's gaining interest, uh, it's gaining uh, support worldwide. Um, one of the stimuli for lifestyle-based illness is rapid ur urbanization, and that implies a relative estrangement from nature. People are more distant from living things, green environments. Forest medicine and other forms of nature therapy prescribe immersing the patient back into nature. It's called forest bathing, soaking yourself in the forest as a form of therapy. Well, for me, this calls to mind one of the American transcendental philosophers, Ralph Waldo Emerson. In the 1800s, he wrote, in the woods, I feel that nothing can befall me which nature cannot repair. Miyazaki, a Japanese researcher, published a review of the Japanese research on forest medicine. Unfortunately, this rather large body of research is published almost entirely in Japanese. Um, but in his summary, he reported that 
immersing the individual in the forest environment for um, hours or days at a time produced a 12.4% decrease in cortisol levels, which correlates with stress, a 7% decrease in sympathetic nervous activation, which again, the sympathetic nervous system is driven into greater activity under stress, 5.8% decrease in heart rate, 55% increase in parasympathetic activation. Well, the parasympathetic nervous system is more activated when we're relaxed, when we're letting go of tensions. An increase in immune function, which persisted for a full month after forest exposure. So in other words, immersing the patient in the forest environment had a lingering effect on the, the body's ability to combat disease, which lasted for at least a month. Now, research is emerging in Western uh, countries and being published in Western journals, so that research is becoming more available. And it supports benefits of exposure to nature and green environments, although the experts almost, almost uniformly call for better designed research. The research in this area still involves very small studies and sometimes some flawed or weak methodologies. But it does appear that exposure to nature, time spent in the forest, um, is beneficial to the body and to health. Even exposure to indoor houseplants can reduce psychological and physiological stress levels and moderate autonomic nervous activation. And this was um, cited, this finding was cited by Miyazaki in another study. So I've reviewed quite a few paradigms. Which one is right? I think we need to look at all of these paradigms and integrate elements of them into our own um, personal integrative approach to healthcare. Some of the values which are embodied in our graduate programs at Saybrook uh, are also values infusing integrative medicine. We're emphasizing mind, body, and spirit because psychosocial and spiritual crises contribute to illness. We base our healthcare on a recognition that stress governs the onset and even the exacerbation of illness. So I get sick or I become more sick um, and stay sick because of stress. We focus on lifestyle change, changes in attitude, and acquiring self-care skills. So in the Mind-Body-Spirit Integration Seminar, you will be practicing self-care skills. We're dedicated to pursuing higher level wellness, not just treating illness. Our job isn't done when the illness is gone. Rather, how can we introduce um, health-enhancing, health-supporting behaviors to keep the person at a higher level of wellness? We're attuned to enhancing quality of life, even when illness can't be cured. We're focused on the person, strengthening the person, not focused on the disease. We're emphasizing interventions that call out the healing powers of the organism. We're looking for an active role for the patient in the healing process, not only in choosing treatments, but also in participating in making lifestyle changes and behavioral changes and managing their illness. We're supportive, emphasizing a personal relationship between the healer and the patient. We're distrustful of invasive treatments that crush the disease but harm the patient. That doesn't mean there's no place for invasive treatments. Uh, when my wife had uh, serious cancer, which then later returned in metastases, uh, she underwent rigorous uh, chemotherapy and radiation, but we also then followed up with healthy lifestyle uh, to keep her healthy long-term. Integrative healthcare attends to the patient's history, including ad early adverse childhood experiences. We focus on the patient's lived experience, the meaning they're pursuing in their lives. Epigenetics, lifestyle medicine, and functional medicine come together um, in examining the long-term health impact of each element in lifestyle. Ecosystems approaches challenge the patient to re-examine their environment. 
how is your environment? What can you do to make it more healthy? How can you at least uh, regularly spend time in healthier environments? So I've covered the field of integrative healthcare, pursued some of the relevant paradigms. I wish you well, and I look forward to interacting with you during the virtual uh, Mind Body Spirit Integration Seminar that you will be attending soon. Uh, take care and best wishes to each of you.